I've titled this sermon Authority, coming from verse 8 here. The centurion says, I too am a man under authority. That was the thing he got a hold of, that Jesus had authority. That's why he pleaded with him, and that's why he was so confident that his servant would be healed, because Jesus had authority. Authority is an interesting word. It signifies orientation or where something comes from. It's related in this way to the word author or creator. To have authority over something means that you own it. Authority is different than power. Power is the ability to do something. And people do things every day that they do not have the authority to do. Authority speaks of a right, of an ownership. It actually speaks of a, of a freedom to do with something as you will because it is yours. Authority in this way only truly belongs to God, who is the author and maker of all things. Authority is the right to do with yours as you wish, and God knows His authority, loves His authority, and His Son ministered His authority when He came here. So we're going to see just three, just three considerations from this very interesting and precious story. First, that the centurion saw his whole dilemma and solution in his own life. He could see the answer that he needed in the structure of his own life. And that's what he says, I too am a man under authority. Secondly, we'll look at the remarkability of his faith. Jesus was impressed by his faith. I tell you, not even in Israel... Have I found such great faith? So what made his faith remarkable? That's what we'll consider. Second, And then third, just three uses of this teaching that we can apply to our lives this week. So first, the centurion saw the whole thing in his own life. He says, I too am a man set under authority. The word set here is important. He doesn't just say, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man set under authority. It speaks of an orderliness. The centurion's life was totally ordered. You can see that order in his very name, centurion. That means that he was over 100 Roman soldiers. It was order. And those soldiers answered directly to him. And he had superiors over himself that he answered to. He was part of the Roman battalions the, the the roman army was orderly from top to bottom there was discipline within the roman the structure of the roman army and a word could go from the very top down to the very bottom with certainty that that word would be delivered and executed because of the orderly structure of it the centurion knew his place within the structure of his world it was sort of mathematical. It was, it, it, it was uh, sophisticated. It was designed. And authority flowed within that world from top to bottom and from bottom to top. And that world worked. That world worked. It was not an evil world in itself. John the Baptist told the Roman, the Roman soldiers to be happy with their wages, uh, but he didn't tell them to leave the Roman army. There's, there's, there was some orderliness in there that's a good thing. So the centurion sees the whole thing in his own ordered life. I too am a man set under authority. So I think we understand that part. But I think maybe when we read this text or we hear this story, we think, okay, what he's really saying is, I'm under authority, so I understand it. But you, Jesus, you are the authority. But that's not exactly what he's saying. Notice how he says it. I, too, am a man under authority. Also me. He sees a likeness between him. Yo, you can move that bag if you need, bro. All right. He sees a likeness between himself and Jesus that Jesus is also a man. He uses the word man. He's a man set or ordered under authority. The centurion sees something about Jesus' place in the universe and in the created order that's like his own. 
He has authority over him that he ministers to those under him. And the same thing is true with Christ. He sees Christ as one who is set under authority in an orderly structure under God himself. Uh, the centurion's point is that he too embodies and administers authority on behalf of a superior. This is a little bit different than just seeing Jesus as the source of all authority. There's important points here which we'll get to. Jesus is himself a man set under authority. Now, the centurion is so correct about this that Jesus not, doesn't correct him, but he grants him his wish because his faith is so great and his faith is grounded on truth. So when the centurion says that Jesus, like him, is a man set or ordered under authority, he's right. Jesus honors what he says and speaks it as truth, a man under authority. What was the authority that Jesus had? Well, like the centurion, and he points this out, he has authority to say things and to see those things executed by others. The centurion says to one, go, and he goes, another, come, and he comes, to a servant, do this, and he does it, is the word that's spoken. And the word sets the, 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 the subject into action, and the subject executes the will of the superior. Pretty straightforward. And that's exactly what the centurion wants. He wants Jesus to just say the word right where he is. He, he doesn't even have to come to the house. All he has to do is say the word because there are servants under Jesus, like the molecules in the air, like the very structure of our biological framework, like the very disease itself that was afflicting this servant. Jesus' word had authority over those kinds of things, and the centurion knew it. So Jesus had authority to heal in this case. Jesus, we see in this that Jesus also has authority really over all things. If you have authority to speak a word from a different location and, a, and somebody to be healed afar off, you know there's no physical manipulation going on there. You know, there's no sleight of hands in laying on the hand or, or the power of God in Jesus is not limited to his physical body where he, he can touch and minister that authority, but if he's absent, he can't. He can just say the word. Now, Jesus often did lay hands. And people brought people to be laid hands on. The centurion sees even deeper into it. It's part of what makes his faith remarkable, that Jesus has been vested with authority to just say something, and it's done. We see this as an example of the greater reality that Jesus has authority as he says in John 17 too, authority over all flesh has been given to him. Jesus is the man, as the centurion calls him, the man who has authority over us all. Who has authority over everyone who's ever lived and ever will live. Who has authority over all things down to the molecules of our universe. He has authority to forgive sins because He has authority to judge all flesh. Jesus of Nazareth, that man that they did not recognize, that man that they murdered, that man that they crucified, that man that they rejected was the God of the universe in their midst who had told them he was coming and they didn't recognize him. But he is the judge of all the earth. We'll get into uses in our third point and how this applies to us, but I just want to point one thing out here. Uh, we have, there's a lot of heresies today and those heresies are generally not new in history, but they're very popular. A lot of popular heresies, uh, they, are, they, they basically... Uh, teach that Jesus is just a man, right? That's very popular. I mean, you can run through cults. You can run through kind of some fringe Christian sects and see that, that Jesus is just, he's just a creature. He's just a man. That's pretty popular, right? So what do we do when we see that in, in, in more reform circles? We tend to push back against that, right? And we tend to assert 
the deity of Christ, that Jesus is not merely a man, but Jesus is God in the flesh, which the Bible teaches, which Jesus taught, which is true. He is the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. He is. But there's a danger when we do that. We can overemphasize the deity of Christ and really neglect his humanity. And there's danger in that. One, there's danger because that's not true. We, a lot of people, <laughs> discernment blogger types, would probably rebuke the centurion and say, dude, Jesus is not a man set under authority. Jesus is God. <laughs> that's what they would say. Jesus did not write a discernment blog about the centurion later. He displayed his faith and marveled at it and showcased it. We have to be careful that we don't overemphasize the deity of Christ to the neglect of his humanity. The fact that Jesus became a man is vital to our salvation, that he lived a real human life. He was so normal that nobody recognized him. He lived literally a sinless life, and his siblings, his parents, everyone in his town, they just thought he was a normal guy. They couldn't even recognize that he never sinned, right? Because his humanity was so real, so down to earth, so hardy, so genuine, that he looked normal. That's a very important distinction that we have to remember. Why? Well, one, because our salvation depends upon it. He had to live as a real human being, like us, to live in our place and to die in our place. It had to be real. He was truly made flesh, or as the theologians take, he, he took the human nature unto himself. And he became flesh. Our salvation depends upon it. But more than that, our sanctification depends upon it. If you have this sort of idea about Jesus that he's this superman who never laughed, never enjoyed, and, and true holiness is just totally otherworldly, then that's going to harm your own sanctification. Because you're not going to be able to live your life as a normal, regular human being like Jesus was. You're going to miss that whole aspect of who He is. And then holiness becomes this legalistic, super spiritual thing that's not even human anymore. That Christians start looking like Mark Zuckerberg or something. It's not even real anymore. We think holiness is like that. It's not like that. It's not like that. I mean, this is real. Not too long ago, at a very popular Christian conference, a very solid Reformed teacher preached a sermon about the humanity of Christ. And this Calvinistic conference took, deleted the sermon. It refused, to, it refused to, to, uh, to release the audio and the video for it and actually went out of its way to kind of denounce the sermon because it was so down-to-earth and hardy about the humanity of Christ that they thought it was a danger. But beloved, it is no danger. It's vital. You can't make sense of your regular, ordinary life if you had this idea of Jesus and the apostles as somehow superhuman. Jesus was truly human. And yes, he was the second person of the Trinity, made flesh, but he lived his life in dependence upon the power of God. He lived his life in submission and obedience unto God. And a Reformed theologian of no less stature than John Owen has said, that the only act of the, of the divine nature of Christ was when he incarnated himself. And after that, he lived entirely by faith in the Holy Spirit and God's power upon his life. That's amazing. But the centurion got a hold of the real humanity of Christ. And that's probably why he could apply the reality of Jesus to his own situation and he could see the truth. Am I talking like a philosopher? The humanity of Christ is important, and we need to be able to model real down-to-earth Christianity for people so that they can see what it's really about. Serving God as real, genuine, image-bearing, ordinary human beings. Walking with the living God in true holiness. But secondly, let's consider the remarkability of his faith. Uh, he appraised Christ's authority well. He understood. He got it. And interestingly, he didn't even get it from the Bible. He got it from his life, which was even more astounding to Jesus. He, he, he appraised or 
he appreciated what authority Jesus had, rightly, he understood it. Not only did he understand the authority that Jesus had, he even demonstrated it in the story. Notice, he didn't go himself to Jesus to ask him. What did he do? Sent. First he sent elders of the people. And the elders, I mean, this, this, this cat was centurion, Gentile, but he was, so, uh, he was such a blessing to God's people in that area. He had supported and built the synagogue, and he was, a, he was a righteous man who walked in the midst of the people of Israel as a stationed Roman centurion. Astounding. Well, he sent the elders, but then he sent other servants or friends to go to him. So the centurion so much believes that just the word has to be spoken from Jesus that he's even just living that and demonstrating that in the way he's approaching him by sending his own messengers. It's like it's the only idea. He has one idea animating him that Jesus can say a word and heal his servant and everything in his life is, is, is in this situation is mirroring that because he truly believes. So he understood Jesus' authority and he demonstrated his belief by what he did. That's one of the things that makes his faith remarkable. But there's more. He didn't just see Jesus' authority uh, and, 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 and be frozen in fear by it. He wasn't frozen in fear, seeing that here was a man who had authority to, to cast out sicknesses from a distance with just a word. Uh, fear, a kind of fear that paralyzed him, is not what happened. He didn't say, man, there's no way <laughs> that I'm messing with that guy. I'll take the hit, but I'm not getting dealt in with that sort of person <laughs> and that sort of authority. I'm not interested. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. His reaction was one of faith. You know what faith does? It takes. Faith says mine. It does. That's how you know you have faith. If you see the promises of God, you see the offers of Christ, and you say, that's mine. I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to trust God for that. I believe that. That's what faith does. It receives. It's been compared to an open hand that receives, but as long as we remember that that hand that receives closes on the things that are placed in it. That's what faith does. It says mine. And that's what this guy did. He saw there was authority there from God himself, but he, he, he saw that authority as his own. He wanted that. He sought it for himself and for his own uses and his own good. Of course, his servant here was very precious to him. His servant here was close to him, would have been a member of the family. I mean, I'm thinking like, uh, I'm thinking like, like uh, Alfred to Bruce Wayne type of joint here. The servant, uh, the, the member of the family here who served loyalty. Loyal, you know, maybe, maybe the centurion was Batman at night. Who knows? But he had a guy, a servant in his household that was so precious to him and close to him. This is not what we would consider chattel slavery, sort of thing we saw in our own country some hundred years ago, hundreds of years ago. But this was something that was a close-knit friendship and a servanthood. So this man was close to him, and he wanted him healed for his own sake because he was so useful to him. But also... He grabbed Christ's authority for the good of, of the servant. He wanted this authority to be used for someone who was under his own authority. This is a, 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 a man who is, he had goodwill. He, he was large-hearted. He built the synagogue for the Jews. He's seeking the good of his own household. And when he sees this authority, he wants it to be used for the good of those who are under him. This is an authority that he can't get from his station in life. There's no Roman authority that can heal his servant. I mean, something greater, something higher, something mightier. And he wanted to see that administered to his own subordinate. He sought the good of those who were under him. Here was a man who was truly, as the Jewish leaders said, worthy. He stewarded his position in life well. So that also makes it remarkable, doesn't it? That he had the boldness to believe that Jesus would do this for him. He did. And that honored God. And that got Jesus' attention. 
Also, he used all this understanding he had to reason with the Lord. He reasoned with him. You know? He told the friends exactly what to say. I, I, I'm just like you, in a way. I, say, I just say something and it's done, and I know that you can do that. And it's done. That reasoning. Did you know that the Lord loves when we do that? When we reason with Him in prayer. When we bring our reasons why we think the Lord should do something, why we desire Him to do something, what glory it could bring Him, what honor it could bring to His cause, and what good it could do to our lives and the lives of others. God loves when we do that. It shows that we really want these things. It shows that our prayers are thoughtful, that there's a grounding to our prayers, that it does serve God's will. So when you have something, make your request to God. But as you make your requests, reason with the Lord on why this would bring Him glory, and He will love it. Also, he believed it could happen and that it would happen if only Jesus willed it. He believed. He was ready. He had guys running all over to Jesus to get this done. And one final thing that makes it so remarkable is something that by itself wouldn't make it as remarkable, but put it all together. He was a Gentile. He was a Gentile. Jesus says, I tell you, even in Israel, I have not found such faith. He was a Gentile. This means he wasn't raised under the teaching of the Scriptures. He may have given them their synagogue, and he may have been you know, beneficial to them, but he was not a Jew. He was not a Jew by con conversion. He just had a friendly relationship with them. This was not a Jewish man. He, this cat was not circumcised. He was a straight-up Gentile. And he was animated by this kind of faith, and you put it all together, and it was absolutely remarkable. What, you know, the religious gatekeepers of the time would say is, who do you think you are to expect this from our Messiah? Who do you think you are? Do you have some, so, so, some prayer request before God? Do you have some, something you want to do for Christ that the religious people would say, who do you think you are? You might be on the right track. Because that boldness that says, if he offers it, I'm going to take it, is the very essence of living faith, beloved. Who do we think we are? Nobody. But we think He is the generous, loving Lord and Master of the universe. So we can already see uses in this, that we can imitate the centurion. We can be like him in our own lives. And his situation was very desperate. The servant was on the point of death. You have a lot of incidences like this in the Gospels where a child or a servant is dying at the point of death and there's a desperation. In your most desperate needs before God, you go to Him like this. You go to Him expecting. You go to Him reasoning. You go to Him assured that you are being bold and that He's honored by that boldness. You go showing that you actually believe this, that you live this as the centurion did. And I think that you will have your request for God's glory. But let's move into some specific uses that we can take away from this. It's really remarkable. This statement, I too am a man under authority. It's, it's an amazing statement. Uses. First, Jesus is our authority. He himself is set under the authority of God. He ministers God's authority. You know, he's the second Adam. He's the channel through which all of God's power and authority comes. He's the door through which heaven pours onto earth. He, he, he is it. The one-stop shop for the distribution and the administration of the authority and power and goodness of God is through this one man. And that means that we ourselves are under Him. We are under His authority. We answer to Jesus. There is somebody that we answer to. Two, how often do we think about that? I'm accountable to a man who lives in heaven, to a man who rose from the dead. I'm accountable to one in whom is all the authority of God, to whom all the angels of God bow. I'm accountable to one that the Father himself said, 
to my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. He's our authority, beloved. He's it. And we would do well to think more about that, because it is terrifying. Is it not? Is it not at least sobering that Jesus is real and I will give answer to Him? That He watches over my life and He marks it and He knows. I will give an answer to Him for everything because He's over everything. He's over your entire life. Something else that gets us into trouble is compartmentalization where we think our spiritual life is over here and the rest of our life is over here. And we do that by nature, beloved. I know we know that's wrong. All of us know that's wrong, but we do it. Can we throw open the doors of heaven so that we might understand that the authority of Christ is in all of our lives? That everything that comes my way is by His bidding and design. That everything I go through is because He said so to make me more like Him and to reveal Himself to me. Can I live in such a way? He's our authority. So the question is, do you obey His voice? Do you obey when He says? You see, the centurion was ready to obey all. He didn't just want the word said to heal the servant. He, he, he will follow all the words. Isn't it remarkable that we want Jesus to speak healing and restoration in our lives, and that means so much to us, but all the other stuff that He said just falls into the background. If you want Jesus to say the word on a situation in your life, you have to begin by showing that you really trust Him by taking all His words and obeying. You want Him to exercise His authority over a situation in your life? You want Him to exercise His authority over a lost loved one and cause them to be born again? Okay, bet. That's great. You yourself must submit yourself to his authority. Now when I ask the question, do you obey his voice, that probably means different things to different people. Do you obey his voice? Do we mean the mysterious whisper on the wind? Does the God of the universe send secret hidden messages to us that can only be discerned if we're really in tune? Not really. Because his voice is in the Bible, in the written Word of God, the voice of Christ, black and white, subject and verb. You can parse out and break down the language. You can understand what He says. And until that becomes important to us, I don't think God's going to be speaking any great healing or restorative words in our lives, beloved, because that's the one. That's the Word of God. So we must submit ourselves to that. We must show Him that we trust Him. We must follow and obey. And we must believe His Gospel in all of its freeness. If you are here today outside of Christ, it's because you refuse to trust Jesus. You refuse to trust that He'll take care of you. You refuse to trust that He will change you. You refuse to trust that He can wash away all of your sins now. You don't really believe that. So it's not that you're refusing to follow Him. You're just refusing to receive everything He is for you. You see that? That's the refusal. And that's where it begins. Trusting in Jesus. He's our authority. That's our first use. Second use. Jesus uses His authority for our good. That's what the centurion got hold of. The centurion knew he was a sinner. But when he saw the authority of Jesus who was out healing, he saw in Jesus, not a judge, not the judge of all the world. The world's already judged. He saw the Savior of the world. 
the one who was going about doing good, the one who was full of goodwill for all. He saw that Jesus uses that authority for our good because Jesus loves us because He cares about us. And isn't that a use? You can see the authority of Christ in such a way that paralyzes you as a Christian and, and it binds you and, and you become inactive before Him. But if you really get a hold of His authority, you must also see that His Word teaches very, very clearly that the disposition of Christ is the disposition of God, which is the disposition of loving mercy. You love mercy. He delights in, in restoring us. It's not a life of giving us second chances. He delights in absolutely transforming and restoring us. That's part of who God is. He loves to do that. And you have to see Him as full of that goodwill. And full of that goodwill in such a way that's not just good towards others, but it's good towards you. You've got to see that. You've got to put yourself in there. You have to say, mine. If, he, if, if the Son of God is full of this much goodness, then I'm going to take some. <laughs> I'm going to seek it. I'm going to ask Him. And I'm going to take it or die trying. The mercy of Christ for me. He's filled with good will. His authority is not just this bare, iron-fisted thing. The centurion understood that because in the Roman army, it was that. It was just straight authority. Unfeeling, unforgiving authority. Wasn't it? That's why everyone obeyed, because they were terrified in the Roman army. You obeyed, or you were done for. But the authority that Christ ministers is different than that, isn't it? It's an authority that is, it, it, it becomes personified by His love and mercy for us. It, it's an authority that's like alive, that seeks our good. Jesus right now is seated at the right hand of God in order to do what? Well, He's interceding for us to use His cosmic authority for us and for our good. Very tangibly in our lives. Every day, His authority. That's what He wants to do. Perhaps you will send your prayers like messengers to God like the Jewish leaders and the friends of the centurion, perhaps your prayers will be those words sent to God seeking His goodness over you today. Seeking to solve those riddles in your life. Seeking to obliterate those obstacles that keep you from serving Him as you would. That keep others from His will. Perhaps we will expect that He will speak the word back and send the blessing. Thirdly here and lastly, one application of this is that we have authority in Him. Jesus is, He has embedded Himself in the creation. <laughs> He's one of us now, forever. The God-man, yes, but He's one of us forever and ever. He's in this thing. And He embedded Himself within the authority structure. It basically goes like this. Jesus, then God. <laughs> And that's basically it. Who is Jesus but your boss's, 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 boss, the Lord of all. And He ministers all things unto the glory of His heavenly Father as a man unto the glory of God. And as He embedded Himself in the creation as one of us, when He calls us to Himself, we become part of that, don't we? I wonder if you've heard of the keys of the kingdom that the churches have. Churches have the keys of the kingdom of heaven given to local churches like us by the Lord of the universe. The keys. That's authority. That's what we're talking about. Authority. The body of believers has authority in Christ. Do we not? His, his ministers have authority. His office bearers have authority. And all Christians have authority under Christ. When He sent out 
the apostles and disciples to go minister. He told them, he gave, he gave them authority over unclean spirits and diseases. I submit to you that we retain authority over the unclean spirits in Christ. How? Well, if someone was to manifest a demon here this morning, I hope that some of us at least are animated by enough faith to stare that thing in the face, ask its name, and cast it out. Would you be ready to do that? I mean, that happens. <laughs> Have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> I mean, yes. But it's more than that. What are demons after anyway? Well, they're after sin, so that's really the name of the game. The demonic legions are bent on one thing, causing us to sin and not believe the gospel. That's it. So our authority is ministered that way, that we have authority to decimate the lies of the evil one, that we have authority to obliterate temptations, that we have authority to use the Word of God as the sword that it is to trash the lies and schemes of the devil. We have that authority, beloved. If you're in Christ and you have the Spirit of God within you, you use that Bible like a weapon against lies and temptations and believe that it works. Uh, but the authority that we have in Christ, all of us, it includes that, but primarily we find it in this, that we, now we have authority over ourselves in Christ. We had a baptism a couple weeks ago, and it was always important, right, that you go all the way under the water. Boom. I think I, I was a little rough with Finn. I plunged him way under there. As, uh, there's a picture of Aaliyah getting baptized, but all the way under there. Love it. Under. And the picture there in Romans 6 is very simple, that all of us who were baptized were baptized into Christ, into his death and into his resurrection. And what Paul says there is, now we belong to him. Now our bodies, from head to toe, belong to Christ. And our bodies are no longer to be used as weapons of evil or unrighteousness, but now they're weapons of righteousness. Did you know that in Christ you have authority over your own body? You have authority over your own mouth to tell it what to speak. You have authority over your eyes to tell them where to look. You have authority over your ears with what to hear and pay attention to. You have authority over your hands with what they do and over your feet with where they take you, beloved. You have authority to bring all things into subjection to Christ in my own life. In other words, you have an authority the unbeliever does not have. The unbeliever cannot say no to sin, can only say yes, can only offer themselves as the servant of sin. Perhaps that's you this morning, that whenever sin comes, you just say yes, because you're a slave to sin. But in Christ, sin no longer has dominion. Now we have some authority over sin. Now we can say, no, I will not say that. I will not watch that. I will not do that. We can say that. Did you know that? In Christ, we have authority over sin to confess it. That's what sin hates, doesn't it? Getting put out in the light. You have authority to put that vampire of sin in direct sunlight of open fellowship so that it can die. You can do that in Christ. And sure, you get exposed in it, but the sin dies. We have authority to confess sins. We have authority to forsake sins. The course of your life is not written in stone. It may be changed this very day through Christ. We have authority to not listen to sin. Uh, as we end here, just I want to consider the, just something caught my attention about this whole situation is the orderliness of it. It was very orderly. I mentioned earlier, it's a little bit mathematical. I think there's a little bit more to that. Uh, the word mathematics uh, comes from the Greek word that means disciple. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, mathetas, math, mathematics, make disciples. That's what that originally meant. And uh, one thing that we can say about mathematics is it's very ordered. That's also true about discipleship. It's very ordered. To be a disciple of Christ means that the chaos of our sinful lives now starts to get ordered. Mathematics is amazing. It's what animated those great uh, Renaissance people <laughs> that were not just creative artists, but they were orderly mathematical thinkers. Mathematics is important. It gives a structure 
to our lives. When we become disciples in Christ, our lives begin to take on the order of God. And I won't be like your grandmother who said the primary application of that is that you should have a clean room, right? We serve a God of order, so clean your room. Yeah, I mean, Jordan Peterson says it too. It's all good. You should clean the room. But that's not primarily what God has in mind about order. It's about your morality, your, your life, your relationships, the things that you do, the work that you're doing, your relationship with sin, your relationship with righteousness. Orderly, is it not? And when our lives begin to take on the order of God, then we can begin to say things like this. Imitate me as I imitate Christ then we too can begin to make our own disciples. Not when we know what to say, beloved, but when we're living it. Then, even the authority of Christ is ministered through us. I've gone on quite long enough, but this week, beloved, let's think about this. In Christ, because He died and rose again, because He purchased me and washed away all my sins, now I am free to live under His authority and administer that authority to my own soul, to my own body, and to everything around me. Because we too are now set under authority. Let's pray. Father, please make your word living and active in our hearts and help us to take dominion this week for your sake. Give an order to our thinking, to our feeling, and to the very course of our lives because we serve you, the true God of order. Bless us now with your power and with your grace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.